Good morning, Jeff. I hear you loud and clear. Welcome to the International Space Station. Good morning to you, Victor. I'm so thrilled to do this. So if you don't mind, um, I'm a science geek. I'm a space geek. So let's nerd out together right off the top. And, uh, you know, tell me about this mission, because what sort of experiments are you conducting right now? Well, this mission has been great. It's a, an amazing opportunity. We flew here in the Crew Dragon Resilience uh, spacecraft made by uh, SpaceX right out there in Southern California. And that was a major uh, part of our expedition. And now that the four of us are here and we've joined uh, Kate Rubin, Sergey, and Sergey uh, for, to make up a seven-person crew, and there are hundreds of experiments going on inside and outside of the space station. Uh, I'm currently involved in a food physiology experiment that's uh, looking at macronutrients as well as uh, enjoyment and variety of the food that we have up here to eat. Um, also, the way that microgravity affects our sensory and uh, uh, sensory motor skills, um, our visual perception, and our um, uh, time perception. Uh, and there's all kinds of different experiments. I could name you dozens and dozens of them. You know, you're certainly a very fit guy, so are you dealing with any sort of muscular atrophy or anything being in zero gravity at this point? You know, uh, maybe, but I can't blame it on microgravity. Maybe it's because uh, my gym routine suffered a little bit prior to launch just because we were so busy. Actually, now that I've been here on station for uh, about 45 days, I've had the opportunity every day. They protect time for me to go to the gym and, and work out, lift and cardio, and so or, or strength training and cardio. So I, I have no complaints, and I really enjoy exercising in microgravity. It's great. Oh, my goodness. So there's actually a gym on the International Space Station. It's great. We actually have a, it's called the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. It is a system that uses vacuum cylinders since weights wouldn't work up here. We have a, a cycle ergometer uh, so that we can do uh, spin type uh, of training. And then we also have a treadmill, uh, a very nice system. We wear a vest and it pulls us down to the, to the treads and we can run. Uh, and it, the, the three of those together uh, provide a great workout. Um, I've been reading that on the International Space Station, there is also experiments dealing with converting urine into drinkable water. Is that true? You know, there's a, a saying, we turn yesterday's coffee into tomorrow's coffee, and I wouldn't call that an experiment. I guess it, it is something that we need to continue to push that technology so that we can capture more and more of our moisture and turn it into water because moisture in, and that water is so vital to human life. But uh, that's actually a system that we depend on. It's a part of our life support system here on the International Space Station. So I got to ask you the follow-up question because I'm sure the viewers want to know, um, what does it taste like or what's it like? Um, if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't know, and it's better than most tap water that I've had. You, it's, it's actually great. You know, um, speaking of water in space, I'm just kind of curious a little bit in terms of perspiration. Can you sweat in zero gravity? That's a great question. I happen to sweat quite a bit, so I generally like to do my weightlifting first so that I'm not a sweaty mess uh, when I get to the weight, uh, the, the exercise device. But the, uh, the cycle and the treadmill, uh, I pour sweat. I actually w started to wear a headband. I wear a headband because it can wick up some of that sweat, and then I keep a towel right next to me so that I can wick up the rest of it. But you actually do sweat. It's just very interesting because it doesn't, you know, run down your face and your body. It just kind of pools where it's at, like, mo like water does here in microgravity. You know, um, you currently, you're circling the earth every 90 minutes. What's it like to do that? I mean, do you go between sunlight and darkness with each orbit? Absolutely. We have the, the privilege to, to see sunrise and sunset 16 times a day. It is truly amazing. And the, the, the duration of the day and the night varies a little bit uh, as we orbit the Earth, but uh, as the seasons change. But, but to see it with your own eyes, it's hard to, to really explain it in words. I guess if you can imagine what drove humankind to develop microscopes and telescopes so that we could see the very small and the very large at our level, at our scale. Imagine being able to just look out and to see a good chunk of the earth with your own eyes. It really is hard to describe. It's beautiful and it's, uh, it's, it's 
awe-inspiring, and I, it's something that I wish more people could do. Having said that, um, as you do that, when you are looking out through the cupola, are you able to see the United States or your home state of California from that vantage point, and what's that like? I, I'm not 100% sure if I can see the entire state. You, we can see very large swaths of, of, of the, the planet, um, but you can see a, an entire coastline. I mean, you can see from San, San Diego all the way to San Francisco, and that scale, is it's just amazing to think how long it would take me to drive that uh, or to, to um, uh, an example we had not long ago, we flew over Corpus Christi and were headed right to Houston, and we timed it, and it was 43 seconds from Corpus Christi to Houston, and I've made that drive plenty of times, and four and a half hours in 43 seconds was pretty impressive, but it is, it's an amazing thing to be able to see that scale, the weather, the, the oceans, and the land masses, and the beautiful colors up here, it, it really is impressive. You know, the last time you and I talked, I mentioned to you how emotional Dr. Walsh got, how emotional Coach Cal got to see you go into space. And you credit um, your success to them. You credit having good mentors. Any advice to the young people of our country about finding good mentors? You know, I think, first of all, you said it find good mentors. It's important to to know how valuable having someone who's been there and seen that, even if they don't do what you do, but if there's something that or you want to do in the future, it helps to have someone who has blazed that trail already. And so finding a mentor and just knowing that that is important, it, that I think is an important first step. Um, but then the other thing I would say is listen to your mentors. We all need to listen. I have young folks that I mentor and I learn just as much from them as hopefully that I share and impart with them. But it is important to, to find and then to listen to and grow through your relationships with your mentors. You know, leading up to this mission, Victor, you have spoken a lot about social justice and extreme climate conditions here on Earth. We've been experiencing some of that with the wildfires here in California as you orbit the Earth from this perspective now in recent weeks, um, what has that done to your outlook on the issues of social justice and extreme climate conditions? You know, you, when you asked me that last time, I, I, my, my overwhelming feeling was just how big of a question it was. And, and again, I'll say it, it is a massive massive concept, but it is massively important that we take both seriously. And being up here makes me just even more committed to doing the work that it takes to make sure that we protect human life and to make sure that we protect the planet. Again, I wish more people could see what we see up here, not just our planet, but to see the great international cooperation that we have up here with our, our Russian cosmonaut colleagues, Sergei and Sergei, our international partner, Soichi Noguchi, uh, and, the, and the four of us U.S. astronauts that are up here working very hard for all of you down there. Last question, a fun one, if you don't mind. I grew up not far from you, so um, here in Southern California, Mexican cuisine is a big part of our lives. I had heard a few years ago that astronauts eat tortillas in outer space. Is that true? And can you tell me why? You know, the tortilla is quite popular. It's so popular that we have lots of food stored in the area we eat, and they're in boxes and containers and bags, but we have a special container for tortillas that we just keep it full because we're constantly going through tortillas. And I think it's because it's just so versatile. Uh, think of it as like a food koozie. You can use it to grab a hot drink bag, a cold drink bag, and your hands roughly stay the same temperature. You can wrap meat or beans in it. It's just so versatile. You can stuff it full of great, delicious things and then smear condiments all over it or cheese oh i miss good cheese and and it's just a very versatile piece of of cuisine that you can use about with anything up here and no crumbs to get into the equipment uh it is definitely less crummy than say crackers or the the flat breads but um you got to be careful it helps to warm it up first pro tip warm it up first <laughs> Thank you so much. We are also very proud of you. Thank you for being so gracious and all the best to you. Happy New Year to you, sir. Thank you to all my friends and family and all you Californians. It is a great time. Happy New Year to you. I wish you a great 2021. Thanks, Jeff. Great talking to you. Great talking to you, Commander.
Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Well, that was cool. That was fun.